five. Yes, they did. But they also shipped a billion dollars to Pakistan to fund their nuclear program, which has been successful. Both Pakistan and India have nuclear weapons. And they are getting supplied by Pakistan with the nuclear weapons for these missiles. These missiles have a range of 3,500 kilometers. In other words, they can reach to Greece or India and points in between from this base. And this is essentially operational today. As you know, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia has forbidden the U.S. to use its bases. That's new. Uh, Egypt, by the way, is now threatening to prevent the U.S. naval vessels from using the Suez Canal a few days ago. So the tensions there are brewing, and we're not just up against Iraq alone. So let's take a look at Iran. They also are a major player on the block. They have half a million troops, a third of a million reserves, uh, 1,300 tanks. It's a mix of both Soviet and U.S. Uh, armaments. They have only about 884 aircraft, most of which are U.S. F-5s and F-4s, some F-14s. But they also took control of a large number of Soviet-made aircraft, MiG-29s and Su-27s, that left Iraq just before the Persian Gulf War. Remember, they ran off. Well, Iran is the beneficiary of receiving those. They have substantial uh, naval commitments. They've purchased the Silkworm missiles from China in 1999. They have the largest standing army, excluding Turkey, which of course is a NATO member. They have the largest budget for defense, but have been hindered, of course, by 20 years of embargoes. They have an arsenal of ballistic missiles based on Chinese technology. And Chinese technology was advanced by the Clinton administration by selling them the technology to miniaturize the warheads and extend the range. So the Chinese missiles are now more accurate and carry multiple warhead capabilities and are able to sell that to their, to their marketplace. There are, we discover now, recently, 20,000 Russian technicians that are working at the Boucher nuclear site. This is a reactor, but is obviously part of a major nuclear program in Iran. Iran has just uh, contracted with Libya to deliver $13.5 billion worth of missiles with chemical warheads and possibly biological warheads. Okay, so let's take a look at the NATO member, Turkey. And, uh, I won't go through all their background. Um, they, they were really uh, uh, emerged. Um, Turks from the Anatolia formed the Ottoman Empire that survived until the end after the First World War, and Turkey emerged from that. One reason Turkey is so prominent in our observations is their probable involvement in this strange Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Magog being the ancient tribal name for the forebears of the Russians. And uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 emphasizes this part the participation of Meshech and Tubal, which were cities in Anatolia, or the preceding uh, nation that made up, the, made up Turkey. And uh, now, Turkey has been essentially pro-West. We depend on their bases. There are 16 mutual assistance pacts between the generals of Turkey and, and uh, Israel. So at the moment, they're an ally. But if you've studied the background, and I did have time to include it here in the briefing in detail, obviously they are being forced to shift their focus from the west to the east and towards Islam once again. Now, the, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about this invasion of these allies, armed and led by Magog, um, that will, is the occasion where God will intervene rather dramatically to wipe out the invading forces. And uh, many scholars, Hal Lindsey being among, probably the lead among them, feel that this is part of the Armageddon scenario, and they may be right. There are a group of us, myself, Grant Jeffries, and some others, that believe this is a precedent event before Armageddon, in fact, before the 70th week of Daniel. And for some technical reasons I won't go into it, but we watch this closely because uh, it clearly is getting positioned on our horizon. Sheba and Dedan, which are references in Ezekiel that really refer to what we call Saudi Arabia, are not in the action, but on the sidelines, scolding everybody for what's going on. Very interesting passage. Now, where does this really occur? If, you're from, if you've done your prophecy homework, you know about the 70th week of Daniel is the primary timeline for the end times that Gabriel gave Daniel uh, in Daniel chapter 9. 69 weeks were fulfilled to the exact day when Jesus presented himself as the Mashiach Nagid, the, Mashiach Nagid, the, uh, the Messiah, the King. There's an interval between the 69th and the 70th week, that's verse 26 of that series, um, in which the, the, the Messiah is cut off or executed, the city and the temple is destroyed. That interval has lasted about 2,000 years. There is a seven-year period that is the most documented period in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. 
We call it the 70th week of years of Daniel. It's defined by a covenant being enforced by this world leader, but in the middle of that seven-year period, he sets up what is called the abomination of desolation. He actually sets himself up to be worshipped. And the period from that event to the end of that seven-year period, a three-and-a-half-year period, is what Jesus himself labels as the Great Tribulation, quoting from Daniel 12. Now, we know the temple will be standing in order for that to happen. We don't know when it will be rebuilt. It might be rebuilt before this week starts. It might be, be rebuilt during the first half of this week of years. Uh, we don't know, but we do know it's standing then because it gets desecrated by this leader. Now, this seven-year period climaxes in this ultimately climactic battle called the Battle of Armageddon, which, of course, is followed by the second coming in power by the Lord himself, and it also starts a period that we call the Millennium. Now, where does this, the Magog invasion occur? The Magog invasion, according to many scholars, including Hal Lindsey and so forth, occurs as sort of part of this Armageddon scenario. There are a group of us, though, that believe it occurs at or prior to the beginning of the seven-year period. For some technical reasons that aren't important, you need to remember my trademark, which is Acts 17.11, where, where uh, Luke tells you that the, these, that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all their openness of mind, yet searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Now, that's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but search it out for yourself. All I want to do is stir you up to look in the right places to put it together on your own. Well, let's now let's focus on Israel. We'll talk a little bit more detail about Israel. Its flag was officially adopted, of course, in 48. It was first introduced back in 1891 by the Zionist movement. And uh, it's the, the six-pointed star that's so familiar is, is actually dates from about the 14th century. Trying to date it earlier is very difficult. That, that's complicated. If you study the book of Judges, you remember Joshua was instructed when they entered the land to wipe out certain adversarial groups. And his, the succeeding generation failed to follow up on that instruction, which is detailed in Deuteronomy 7 and elsewhere. The strongholds that Israel failed to wipe out constitute the problems that make up the book of Judges. And of course, Jericho is the, the capital of these guys, which means Bet Yerah, it's the, mount, it's the house of the moon god. Um, Ramallah, Nablus, Janine, the Golan, Gaza. What's provocative when you study the book of Judges is to look at the book of Judges as a book of prophecy. Because if you look at Israel today, the territories that are disputed are the very territories that gave them the trouble back then that they failed to deal with adequately. The Golan. Janine, Nablus, Ramallah, Jericho. Jericho is the capital of PLO. And Gaza, the Gaza Strip, of course. How fascinating that the same spirits animating those adversaries then are still at it. But let's move on. When did Israel really begin? Well, in one sense, you could argue that it began with the seed of the woman prophecy in Genesis 3.15, when it was first announced, that when God declared war on Satan. And a summary of this concept of the woman, of course, occurred.